close to 30 years now. Sorry. I just wanted yeah, to get what you were saying, Josh, sorry. I was just saying that Eric's been at this for a long time, trying to educate people, spread the word, um, you know, spread awareness. And actually, Eric, you've been doing this from a time that uh, the internet wasn't rocking and rolling like it is today. And so that made really getting the word out there, spreading awareness, very challenging. Yeah, in fact, um, I was in an e-group, an email group set up by Barbara Herskowitz before Facebook or Yahoo groups. The uh, only way to communicate was through email. And we actually had quite a, a good group back in those days. And when Barbara Herskowitz finally transitioned over to the new Yahoo group, I thought we were really making a breakthrough because we were able to make contact with uh, mold advocates, researchers the world over, and somehow it just never went anywhere. Well, thank you for continuing to push forward though, because it's gotta be frustrating, you know? It, this should have been brought to light a long, long, long time ago, what mold can do, the health effects from it. And um, it always seems to fall on deaf ears or it's getting pushed under the rug on purpose. Completely deliberate. As you say, it's on purpose. Our, our, well, uh, our away. Yeah, I'm going to have Keely do the intro. And uh, do you want to just be introed by what you put there in your tagline, Josh? Uh, is it Rachel? Rochelle? Rochelle. Rochelle. Josh okay. Rochelle, owner of Texas Mold Inspectors. Okay. And I don't She's know just, what's in my bio. Emily put that together. <laughs> Oh, I just see it tagged right there on your um, your Zoom. It's a, it just says owner of Texas Mold Inspector Certified Master Inspector. Is that okay if uh, Keely says Emily, that? Emily did send a bio, but we usually edit that in later. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, y'all can say whatever you want. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson, and I'm here with Eric Johnson and Alicia Swamy, and we are Exposing Mold. Today we are interviewing Josh Rochelle, owner of Texas Mold Inspectors. Welcome, Josh. How did Thank you get into you mold testing or mold inspecting? I'm sorry, could you ask again? Sure. How, what, what got you into mold inspection? You know, we kind of got into it almost like a trial by fire. We, when I say we, my wife, my son, myself, uh, we experienced mold probably in one of the worst ways possible, or at least that's the way we perceive it. Um, we were drastically affected by mold in a short period of 13 months in what we refer to as our moldy home. Um, so we learned about the adverse health effects of mold first, found out the hard way, and well, then we started going through remediation. That did not go smoothly at, at all, in fact. Um, getting lied to by the landlord, getting lied to by the quote unquote mold contractor who was not licensed. Um, the entire time they were trying to remediate the home that we were renting, uh, we were in a corporate housing apartment that was furnished. Um, thinking that we could move back into this house after remediation took place. That did not happen. It was supposed to take two weeks and then it was close to three months later, more lies and more lies and more lies. And we found out that at the end of the day, we were not able to move in back into that house. We walked away from everything that we owned. So, <laughs> especially my wife, but we both don't like being lied to. So it was during all the lies, during the remediation process, where I don't know if it was Emily, probably Emily who thought of it. I'll say that. She said, just go get your license so that we have the answer so that we know. And so that's what I did. And man, that opened my eyes. I was in class you know, to obtain my licensure. And I was able to ask my instructor almost in real time, as Emily was reporting to me what was coming back from our contractors and or our landlord, I was literally asking my instructor, can they do this? Can they say this? 
<laughs> is this right? Is this wrong? And yeah, he was shocked that all this was happening. Um, so they botched remediation to the 10th degree. And so at the end of the day, when they said this rental home was cleared, mind you, it's a 4,000 square foot, two story rental home. I had to make sure before I moved my family back in at the end of the day, that's on me now. And because I know what mold can do. <laughs> so I went in after they cleared it the next day and just visually, the place was almost worse off after remediation than before. I mean, just visually, I found countless sources of mold growth. And then of course I still tested and proved analytically that the place was worse than before. So we cut our losses with that home and everything in it, which is tough. I mean, that's just a heart wrenching story. And I feel like I hear that over and over again, that <laughs> you have a problem, you hire a company, which you hope is supposed to solve that problem. And they actually make things worse. Now, now knowing what you know now and your expert opinion, what do you think that they did wrong in their remediation process? Well, for one, they were incompetent because they like to cut corners to save money, um, even though they might issue a bid to execute this work, the more corners they cut, the more money they make, because they're still going to get that amount of money that they issued the bid on. But if they do less work, then it doesn't cost them that money. Um, so incompetence, yes, but really it comes down to even gross negligence or deceptive trade practices or fraudulent. Um, they weren't licensed to do mold remediation, which also tells me that they did not know how to do mold remediation. And then also just, and this is more of a pattern that I'm referencing right now in my experience with many, many mold contractors now, just like with builders, I mean, contractors almost in general, if they can save a buck, They'll do anything they can to save that buck, even if it comes at the expense of our health. And that is what is disgusting. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And um, just to move forward here, we know that you're a mold inspector. Um, could you run us through your process of inspection? Absolutely. Um, and if I get long winded, just shut me down. Um, I would say that my assessments, I definitely make a distinguish, distinction between inspections and an assessment. Um, so I perform assessments. I address a home or just a structure. So it can be residential or commercial. I address it from a building sciences standpoint and then also from construction standards standpoint because a lot of the time when I walk into someone's house and they're wondering if they have a problem with mold, they've already scanned the place. They've already looked everywhere and they can't find any mold. Um, so I'm not shocked when I walk into someone's house and I visually inspect every square inch and I don't see mold, that's, that's fine. I don't stop there though, um, meaning, People are hiring an inspector to give them the answers that they need to either make peace with the fact that there is mold or, hey, you do not have a problem with mold. So I go deep into the house. I get into the attic. I get into the HVAC system. And it's not always readily accessible. So I drill holes. I stick cameras inside of the AC system. Same with walls. If I have a reason to believe that there is mold growth inside of a wall, even though the wall might look perfect, 
I'm going into it. Some of those reasons would be elevated moisture content within the drywall or water damaged baseboard, anything like that. Something that gives me the reason to believe I should go inside that wall to find out, then I will. But I go in with cameras first. I don't just say, hey, I recommend that I sample it here. I I'm not a, a huge fan of sampling a ton. The only time samples are necessary are gonna be when my clients insist on having samples, fine. Then I'll do it, I'll do as many as you want. But my assessments, I focus on finding the mold. So I go inside the walls. I use cameras. I can show them the mold, but hey, it's there. Is it always important to identify the genera or species of mold? It's not always. Meaning, even in remediation, as long as we treat all mold indoors as the worst kind of mold, and we're that careful, then we're going to be successful. Um, but now when I start looking for construction defects that of course lead to mold, I have to have a background in construction or I have to understand the building codes very, very well. So I'll actually diagnose a home's foundation, determine if it's wet or if there's elevated moisture content. I have to determine what type of slab it is or is it on pier and beam but then i start looking at the exterior cladding of the home brick limestone stucco hardy even if it's an older home with shiplap i've got to determine what's behind it was the cladding installed properly for instance with brick we have to have weep holes at the bottom of the brick wall that's a drainage plane that has to be set up for success, the day the bricklayers begin to construct that cladding, if they do not set up the weep holes properly, the water that inevitably runs down the backside of the brick will not be able to evacuate from that wall. So then I move on to the interior of the house. First, I'll start, uh, actually, I end up in the attic at the very end. Um, where the HVACs typically are here in Texas, which is the absolute worst place to put an HVAC system. Um, builders do it out of convenience. That's, that's why they're doing that. Um, finding out, by the way, with the HVAC system, is it set up properly? So I have to understand what a lot of HVAC technicians have to understand. You know, the mechanical layout of the ducting are the each and every component of the HVAC system. Mind you, the word system is very important. It all has to work together. So if we have incompatible components, that's gonna, that may cause other components to struggle or to perform suboptimally, which ends up in many situations causing high static pressure in the system which again will cause it to perform suboptimally. So it's not gonna dehumidify the air, condition that air properly. Um, then, you know, simply looking at ducting, you know, flex ducts, doesn't matter what type of ducting, which I hate flex duct, but, you know, are there 90 degree turns? Do we have straps that are just choking the duct, which suppresses air flowing through it? The more instances where that occurs, now we're, again, asserting back pressure on the primary HVAC system, causing it to perform suboptimally. So I look at all those different things and try to understand how the entire home is operating as a system. Because where one area of that system, the entire home is failing, that's gonna cause another area to perhaps have problems with water intrusion or water vapor intrusion, also known as air infiltration. And that's really the biggest part of my assessment. I like to say, follow the air, air infiltration, y'all. If you had to ask me, I almost wanted you to ask me this first, but by far the biggest problem we have with mold in, in this applies to the entire United States 
I've actually been outside the country to where it does, does apply. Biggest problem with mold is due to air infiltration. Yes, if we have a flood, that's horrible, that's bad. <laughs> but air infiltration, it would shock you. How many homes are affected by air infiltration? Now, why is that important? Because of water vapor. When I say air infiltration, that air has to be coming in from the outside environment. Now, especially here in Texas, y'all, it's all humid. It's all, nothing but humidity. So if we have humid air entering a home, it typically enters in areas where we cannot see it. And so I always break it down for my clients very, very, very simply. For mold to grow three basic necessities, food, oxygen, and water. So if we have outside air entering into our attics per design, vented attics, and it's, if it is able to, from the attic, drive straight down into the walls of the home, well, let's think about the walls or walls cavity. The backside of a drywall, it's a paper, cellulose. In fact, I would say that mold grows on paper more quickly than any other construction materials. Then also we have wooden framework. So we have plenty of food. We also have dust inside the wall, plenty of food inside the wall. Oxygen will be inside of that wall by default, whether we have air flowing through it or not. So the third thing necessary for mold to grow, and mind you, once we have all three of these components necessary for mold to grow, then mold growth is inevitable. We can't stop it. It will grow on glass. It will grow on anything. Last thing we need is a source of water. And so many of us just focus on liquid water, busted pipe, outside floods our home. Those things are obvious to me. But water vapor is all that is necessary for mold to grow when you have oxygen and food present. So I have to understand everything about a home, how it's constructed, how is air getting in? <laughs> A lot of times it comes down to the builder. They missed something. They didn't install components properly. So that's allowing air to enter the home. It would freak out if you knew exactly how many homes have to be gutted due to mold. Gutted. And I'm not being overly dramatic, meaning I prove it in many situations. Oh, thank you for that breakdown. And, you know, I, what comes to my mind automatically when you're talking about how you inspect and your knowledge base. So in order to be a mold tester, you need more than just a weekend certificate. Is that correct? I would say definitely. In fact, <laughs> I have to be careful what I say on here because a lot of defense counsel, they're going to probably be watch this and try to pick it apart. But um, you know, after I took the class through the Department of State Health Services, that agency at the time was actually issuing a mold assessment consultant's license. Now it's the Texas Department of Licensing and Re Re uh, Registration, so TDLR. The, I'll say this though, that the class that I took does not prepare an inspector for what they are to do. They briefly tell you about a moisture meter, briefly talk about, you know, thermography, um, briefly talk about trying to determine what areas are impacted, what to look for, this and that. Um, what I liked about my class is this. I felt my instructor was passionate about what he was talking about. And he said one thing, he said, at the end of, I think it was the end of the second day of class, he said, all right, you know, tomorrow we're gonna get into building sciences. He said, that is my favorite part of this entire class. And I was thinking to myself, okay, why? So I was excited, looking forward to it, right? That's where a lot of things got over my head in that class, I'm not gonna lie. But I remember that he always said that. So 
once I got out, had my license, I started studying building sciences on at my speed, at my rate. I mean, this guy was way up there. I think he is actually, what is he called? Some kind of building scientist. He has some kind of degree. I mean, the guy was genius. But um, after we get our license, that's when everything counts. Everything counts. People are relying on us to give them enough information to know, hey, is my house making me sick? Or is it something that can be remediated? But if we're going in there with the basics, and that's what that's what our uh, state agencies would allow us to be equipped with. Well, that's that's a joke. And, and sorry, I run into that with inspectors all the time, and I report them very quickly to the state. I try to get a lot of them sued too. Wow. You're a, bit, you're a big fish out there <laughs> trying to take these bad people down. And I really do appreciate that because we need honest people like you. We need people who are coming in and, and doing a thorough job. I mean, if people are spending thousands of dollars on this, it needs to be thorough. And with that said, do you think a home can be accurately assessed in an, in an hour or less? My quick answer is no. Um, but now let's say I walk into a house that someone's looking to purchase. The house is empty and, and I'm not having to move furniture or I'm not having to answer a ton of questions during my assessment, then I can. But now I've done it thousands of times. So I know where to look for all the construction defects. But let's say I walk into a house that is occupied by a family. I'm on my hands and knees looking for this mold, understanding history of the home by the types of mold that I see on surfaces. Where is it on the surface? Um, also looking for water damage that might have occurred in the past, but it's been painted or covered up. Um, so it's more of a forensic style of an assessment where I'm really getting into the details of what was not disclosed, meaning I'm trying to find out history on a home when no one knows it. Um, I get those calls a lot where, you know, someone, our clients purchased a home from a seller, let's say a year ago, nothing was disclosed. I'm thinking to myself, this is a 30 year old home and nothing happened. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. But yet nothing is disclosed and Everyone in the family is sick, inexplicably. They can't, their home inspector didn't catch anything, of course. Which don't get me started on home inspectors. My goodness. Um, so no one has found a problem. Sometimes they'll already have three inspection companies, mold inspection companies that have been out there before me. No one can find anything. But as I'm walking up to the home, I already see the issues. Like, really? We're not educating our inspectors properly, but I'm sorry, sometimes I bounce around. Um, so when a home is occupied and I'm dealing with the environment in real time with the family there, two, three, four hours, I have, I have spent seven hours in a home. And, and it wasn't necessarily a 12,000 square foot home. You know, it can be a 2,500 square foot home. I'm there as long as it takes. So it makes sense. It makes sense because I feel like there's some inspectors that will come in and they'll spend 30 minutes taking our samples and go. You know, it's like, no, oh, you got to spend a little bit more time investigating. And I feel like that probably is a really good question for someone who is sick in their home and they want an inspector to come out. Hey, how long is it going to take? And if they say an hour or less, then Red flag, you know, you might want to be careful for that. Well, you're, you're bringing up a very good topic, which is if someone is there 30 minutes or even an hour or less, and they've actually obtained samples, let's say they took six air samples, five inside, one outside, five minutes apiece, 
I mean, six of those, it takes 30 minutes just to obtain those samples, plus you have a couple minutes in between. And if they were only there 45 minutes, usually when they walk into the house, there's a brief conversation. So that means they didn't assess the house at all. And I'll say this, I'm the opposite. 90% of what I do is my assessment, understanding the home. 10% of what I do is the sampling. That doesn't take long at all. Um, so I would, I would say this, and, and it might be an overgeneralization, fine, but this is also based on my experience with other inspectors, so it comes from a good place. <laughs> the vast majority of inspectors out there are not performing an assessment at all. They're walking in, seeing how many samples they can take, pushing that limit, and they're out. They've got four or five other assessments in the same day. They're making a killing doing that with little to no liability whatsoever. Wow. Thank you for, for pointing that out. And I think that's, that's a really, really important, important point to put out that, you know, it's, they're not really caring about the individual. It's more so the bottom line in that case. Correct. Um, and I'm just really curious, what are the most common molds you're finding in homes these days? Growing in the home, I would say Penicillium aspergillus, Stachybotrys ketomium, Trichoderma. To this day, I've never found a source of Fusarium isolated from other molds. I mean, does it show up in samples? Yes. Um, so I'm not going to say that one is as common as the other ones I've mentioned. And of course, you have Ascospores, Psidiospores, and Cladosporium. Cladosporium is a bigger issue than so many people understand. It really is. Um, gosh, that is so prevalent in apartments when it comes to the HVAC systems over there. But um, yeah, I would say those are, are I guess, I'm not going to say the heavy hitters, the most common ones that... I can consider self-originating mold growth in homes. And look, people don't call me unless they have a problem or think they have a problem typically. So I'm finding also those molds that I mentioned are also responsible for adverse health conditions. Looking back to your most sickest clients, um, was there a common mold that you found or molds that you found in their home? Stachybotrys, Ketomium, Penicillium, Aspergillus. That's interesting. That's something that we, we like to ask every mold tester that we bring on here. Is there a correlation <laughs> between Definitely. the severity of sickness and certain strains of, of mold? Well, yes, definitely. Meaning I'm just doubling down on what you're talking about right now, which is Look, when I first got into this, I was studying mold, 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 mold. Gosh, I should have been studying mycotoxins. I almost use this example. If a snake bites us, it hurts, but when it injects its venom, it can be fatal. I say mold is worse. When mold gets in us, it can grow. In fact, if we consider what is mold's primary function on this earth, it is to decompose when it gets inside of us. What's to stop it from changing its standard operating procedure? Nothing. It's going to start decomposing. So that's very bad. But the mycotoxins produced by mold, I'm not going to say are infinitely more harmful. They are exponentially more harmful. Majority of mycotoxins are class two and class one carcinogens. Class one carcinogens, you're talking about existing with the most toxic substances known to man. And that's what these microscopic spores produce. It's mind boggling. Thank you for that. And um, you mentioned earlier that you have experience uh, testifying on stand 
Um, and that's pretty unique from the Molchesters that we spoke to. I don't, I don't believe that it's not primarily what they enjoy doing or they usually refer out. How's that experience been? Have you been helping people uh, win settlements, cases, um, get out of their leases, et cetera? All the time. Um, it, it's, I'm not gonna say it's easy to get someone out of their lease because it's not me getting them out of their lease. They still have to get an attorney. Um, well, if someone just wants out of their lease, that typically is the easiest part because in a way, if the landlord can say, you know what, fine, yes, you can just go, then they're dodging a bullet. They're dodging a lawsuit. If the tenant, you know, my client is okay with that. Um, that happens all the time. And, you know, as far as having to testify in the beginning, yes, I was nervous, but I always reminded myself, I'm literally telling the truth, just telling the truth and opening up people's eyes, I guess. So it became very easy um, after just being deposed a few times. Um, and, you know, I wondered to myself, why? Why, why isn't every mold assessment consultant, let's say, why aren't they all specializing in litigation? Because it's not like I, I chose or sought out to be in, in all these different cases. I didn't choose that. If I'm doing my job properly, that's just going to come with the territory. If I'm finding all of the mold, then a lot of times my clients want to hold someone responsible if it's not by their own doing. And I always have a duty to my clients. I have to do what's right. So if I have to testify, heck yeah, I'll testify. Um, this is true. I'm just sharing the truth. And it does come down to collecting evidence properly and documenting every step you take in the house properly, you know, calibrating your devices, things like that. Um, and also understanding, <laughs> here's the bad, I mean, it's all bad, but... Here's what is almost just unthinkable, but it happens every day. So if someone wants to establish a case, let's say, again, let's say it's an apartment and they live in a very moldy apartment and the property management company will not do anything for them to help. They're just, they're ignoring them or they're calling it dust, something stupid like that. So I go in, I establish a case for them. I already know what's going to happen after I produce my report. The property management company, and this is 99 out of 100 times, let's say, they're going to hire their own mold inspector to come in and say everything's fine. That's, that's far from the truth. So I've had to modify my assessments to get out in front of the corruption that exists out there. And that's why... When I assess a home or an apartment anywhere, I focus on finding the mold visually, finding the source of water contributing to that mold. And I prove that. And then when I sample, I'm wearing a body cam that documents every step I take. Because look, when, I, when I'm getting deposed, they try to drag me through the mud. They crack me. Typically, people lose their case. Um, they're going to question the data that comes back from the lab. And then they're going to have a million questions about, well, how did you get this data? You know, Describe how you took the sample. So I try to stay out in front of all of these talking points that the defense counsel tries to crack me with by, okay, fine. I'll just start videoing my assessments. I have nothing to hide. I have only everything to show and to prove. So I strapped it on. Um, but I also started wearing body cams because I started uh, recommending to my clients, look, hey, 
you know, the property management company, they're going to send in their own mold inspector. If you give me enough heads up, I will be here on that day wearing a body cam. Not to, not to interfere or impede with their investigation, but gosh, they shake. They shake in their boots. And it really throws them off. Sometimes they just start talking because they're nervous. You know, I'm like, just talk, keep talking. That's good. Yeah. Um, they just dig a grave. More they talk. But um, so, you know, by being very, very thorough with our assessments and standing behind our assessments for our clients, we end up, we kind of got thrown into the litigation scene full force. And so we started honing our assessments to where, you know, we're learning what does this inspector do, this bad inspector do, this builder's inspector do. And that's why I start to learn their habits. And so I try to catch them because at the end of the day, I'm a headhunter. I want the bad people out. I want the corrupt people out. They have no idea what they're doing when they're ill-advising even clients that, hey, your house is fine. So, or hey, you know, the 20 air quality samples I took do not indicate there's an issue. So your house is great. It's the best house I've ever been in. I hear that all the time. So those clients might never think about mold again, but yet they're gonna stay sick and they're gonna stay in that best house and shame on those inspectors. I have a feeling you get a lot of death threats after your cases. <laughs> I carry heavily, let's put it that way. I, I, I carry heavily. I've got a lot of builders that don't like me at all. You're going to have to hire some bodyguards. <laughs> I think like uh, Bob McKee does. I think Bob McKee has bodyguards. <laughs> Uh, he's a great attorney. Um, but you know, I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench into the mix here. I hope you're ready, Josh. Um, so how often do you see a neighbor's house being a problem for someone or the outdoor air containing much higher spore counts than what you're seeing inside? So let's talk about the outdoor air containing higher counts than inside. In my experience, meaning I'm talking about the samples that I have obtained, very, very, very rare for the outside air to exceed what is inside of a house, except when it comes to ascospores and psidiospores and sometimes cladosporium. Sometimes I'll see just massive numbers outside, but that's because someone's mowing outside, and so that kicks up all of these mold spores. Um, but I try not to take an outside sample when someone is mowing. I'll just wait, let the air clear outside, let the wind blow it away. Um, but let's talk about penicillium aspergillus-like. Let's talk about that one. I'm not going to say I can count it on two hands because I've taken thousands of outside samples. But I would say nine out of 10 outdoor samples that I obtain for a control, no penicillium or aspergillus comes back. Here's why. I don't take it next to a rotting fence or a flower bed or one foot from the front door. Also, when I take that, when I hit start on that pump, I'm not standing right next to the pump. If I just assess someone's entire home where they have a problem with penicillium and aspergillus, then it's all over my clothes. Why would I stand next to the pump when I take my outside control sample? That's not proper. Um, but also I'm standing downwind from my bio pump. If I stand upwind from it when I'm doing an outside control and I just, and I have mold all over myself, then the wind blows over the top of me, carries the mold spores right over the cross, across the top of my machine when I'm obtaining a sample. So producing inaccurate numbers, meaning that's a false positive. Um, so 
taking the outside control sample is very, very, very important when you consider the location where I am standing is extremely important because we have to understand that we just assessed someone's home. It's going to be on us. But now, okay, that's my outside control sample. And that's, I mean, there are many factors that will influence that. But now let's talk about the outdoor air in general. I have close, uh, it could be 60 or 80 lawsuits in one community alone near the coast in Texas. And y'all, just walking through that neighborhood, it's not healthy. Those are just the lawsuits I'm involved in. But there are many, many, it's almost every home in this neighborhood. I'm talking about, I think it's 1,500 plus homes. So if all of those homes are growing mold, manufacturing mold, well then cross-contaminating the outside environment is inevitable. That's unnatural, meaning this, this is not naturally occurring mold that we would consider in nature, let's say. This is self-originated mold growth due to construction defects in this community. That's actually causing environmental contamination. So can a house influence a neighbors? Absolutely. Can a house influence just the air outside of the home? Absolutely. That goes, I mean, Definitely. Now, let's say this, Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston. <laughs> I would not walk up and down streets unless I was wearing protective clothing and I had on face masks. Because that's how bad the environment was outside. Here, these homeowners are just ripping out all of this drywall and all, all of these moldy items and putting it on the curb. I mean, that goes without saying that's going to be an unhealthy environment outside. But if, yeah, if you have a neighbor that has a very bad issue with mold, yes, that can definitely influence the indoor air quality in your home. It definitely can. Sorry if I got off on a tangent there. No, no, thank you for that. I really appreciate the thoroughness. And um, I'm just curious if you ever have told someone that their home is unlivable and that they need to move. All the time, all of the time to where it's never as many times as I've had to say that, meaning your home is unfit for occupancy. Those are my words. It doesn't make it easier for me to say it, but I don't hesitate to say it because that is my duty. Once I understand how bad a home is, then I have to say it. But I mean, almost a daily basis, I have to say that. Wow, oh, almost a daily basis. That's, yes. <laughs> that's very concerning, jeez. Um, have you ever gotten feedback from a landlord in which you have produced a letter for the tenant to provide to the landlord saying that the environment is unfit? And has the landlord ever responded back like, oh, you know, we're gonna fix it or anything? Like, do you ever follow up beyond what you do with your clients to see if these landlords are just moving one person out and bringing someone else in into these unfit environments? It's the latter. It's what you just said. Let's say the landlord, yeah, sure, you can break your lease. That landlord's not gonna fix the apartment. Because by the way, when I, when I go to an apartment, yes, I'm assessing that apartment, but since I'm understanding how that apartment was constructed, that means that applies to the entire structure, not just that one apartment. So that means the entire, let's say there are 50 units in that apartment building, then I will cite the building, the structure as unfit for human occupancy, not just the apartment. And so, yes, we've had landlords, Never the apartment complex, property management company. They're trained to lie. So they've been down this road before. 
they don't typically contact us um, because they're focused on smoke and mirrors. They're focused on getting rid of that tenant as quickly as possible. Or if I write that letter, typically it's because my client already has counsel and attorney. So the attorney is doing the back and forth. But yes, we've been contacted a lot by people that are very, very upset about what I say. And my job is to deliver, to deliver very accurate information. And uh, sometimes, you know, people get upset, especially when, God, this one blows up a lot though. So let's say you're looking to purchase a home. So you send me in to assess that home, let's say during the option period. And the seller agrees to allow this mold inspection to take place. <laughs> so at the end of that inspection, I will issue a letter, I will issue a report. I'm citing a home as unfit for occupancy. That seller of the home is not too happy. And we've had some people go at us very hard, trying to report us to the states. I mean, they try to, they slander our company horribly. I mean, we're definitely a target, but we do right by our clients. Wow, I'm so sorry you're dealing with that. And, you know, I hope that you're able to surpass all of the people trying to take you guys down because it sounds like what you're doing is really great, honest, honest work, basically. Um, and just my last question before I hand it over to Eric. Since you've started uh, testing and inspections, are you noticing an increase in toxic mold being found in homes? Undoubtedly. Um, when I say that, when I first got into this industry, I was looking for small isolated areas in homes. I was looking, yes, for hidden mold, but the more I self-educated myself, the more homes that I went into, I started finding systemic issues. I mean, so systemic that it is hard to believe how big of a problem we have with self-originating mold growth growing inside of our homes, especially when we consider where it is. It's in places that we can't see. Um, I'm trying not to say it. I'm trying not to say how bad the problem is just because I have to be careful because yes, this video is going to be posted. And again, I have a lot of attorneys that want to take me down. So I have to be careful, but um, the, the problem with mold is so, so bad. It, it, it would blow your mind. And perhaps we have that conversation over the phone, but meaning it does need to be shared with the world. It's just, I've got to figure out how to do it. Um, I don't want the message to fall on deaf ears and timing is everything. The credentials behind it are everything. So it might not be me telling them, but I also don't want to compromise a lot of active lawsuits that I'm in, you know, I mean, a lot. So I don't know if I answered you appropriately. You did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so do you uh, run into people who have, were diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome? I have to say, yes, I can't think of them right off the bat. I, I've heard, I run into clients, Eric, that have stuff I've never heard of, but CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, yes. Or their doctor threw it out there, but their doctor didn't really, quote unquote, diagnose them. I mean, doctors are an issue too. Um, but I don't run into them as often anymore, let's say. Well, the curious thing to me is that back in the 1980s, this problem did not exist. There were no mold remediators. There were no mold testers. Um, 
producers of air filters didn't even list mold spores on what an air filter could be expected to take out of the air. There was none of this stuff. And then when the uh, Center for Disease Control ran into problems of sick teachers in sick buildings, they were unable to identify mold as a problem. And none of the researchers, doctors, or even people who analyzed the situation were able to identify mold as any kind of a factor. So how did we get from this being such a non-issue back in the 1980s to everybody having a mold story today? Oh, that is a good question, because I could throw out the common answers, which are we're able to do a lot of our own research now. Meaning, how did my wife and I find out we had mold? Well, because we didn't know it was mold, but we start, I hate even say the word now, we started Googling just the random symptoms that we were all having. And then my, my wife just noticed a pattern and the results that started popping up kept seeing the word mold. So, so that's how we found out. And yes, we found out there are actually mold inspectors or consultants or technicians out there that do this. And we had no idea about that either. And so, you know, it was through desperation that we found out. And I would say God definitely put the right people in our path so that we could get the answers that we needed. Um, but, but going back to the 80s, I want to say it's because it's being, it was covered up perfectly back then. And technology, meaning information at our fingertips, was not as readily available. So I think the cover-up attempts from many different organizations, entities, was very effective. But that's how far I go with this. Yeah, um, if you look at the failure of doctors to take interest in this, it's clear that they're covering up something that's happening in plain sight. They're not responding in an appropriate way. So I realized early on that doctors are not an accurate source of information for how this thing is progressing. I would almost say, Eric, that if a doctor is testifying, mainstream medical doctor, if they're testifying as to what mold can and cannot do, I would almost say they're not even qualified to make that determination because they don't get taught about it at all. So then why, what would make them qualified? Um, but yes, then you have the doctor's that are ignoring it when it's, it's this obvious. Meaning I have, if I were a doctor and I had a patient come in and say, I think this is mold, everything I'm reading, telling me mold is doing all of this. If, doc, if I, as that doctor say to that, my patient, no, that's crazy, they can't do that to you. Shame on me. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, engineer, rocket scientist. If we don't know the answer, why are we giving an answer at all? Why don't we just go educate ourselves and then come back and say, okay, here's my answer based on my research. But no, we're being misled, misguided by our, by the professionals that we have almost been trained to rely upon. Yeah, it's almost impossible to go online without finding out that toxic mold is a problem. So how so many doctors can remain oblivious, that in itself needs some study. There's clearly some sociological hindrance in their, in their, their brains, their minds, that shuts them off to this. Money. <laughs> but um, to say it. if you're working in the business, obviously, you, you don't have that impediment. I mean, you want to know about toxic mold. You go ahead and you Google it up and you find out. So the people in the, in the trades, the construction industry, remediation, they go online, they learn all about it, it's easy. You wonder what's wrong with doctors that they can't do the same thing. But after finding out that doctors were actually blocking this out and refusing to investigate, I thought, what's the best way that I can research this to find out 
what's the true level of knowledge in this? So I went out to the contractors that were cleaning up flood damage. I mean, they're coming face to face with the mold. If they're getting sick from it, they're not going to be able to hide it. They're going to know. And amazingly enough, back in the 80s and 90s, this was not a problem. People cleaned up mold, dressed in their Levi's, not even wearing a face mask, just going out there with a crowbar and busting out all this black mold from sheetrock, throwing it in a dumpster, carting it away, and it was never a problem. And then in the 1990s, all of a sudden it was a problem. I started picking up stories. Yeah, people are going out there and they'd work with it, uh, they'd rip up a house, and they were either laid out for weeks, maybe even months. Some people got so sick they weren't even recovering. So that was the way to, to investigate this, not by doctors, they can't give us any accurate information, is to get it from people who are actually working with this stuff on a daily basis. I agree completely, meaning, So I have several thousand clients that look, when I walk in and I meet them, I, I want to hear it. I want to, what are their concerns? What are you experiencing? I mean, I ask them, I interview them. That's what I'm supposed to do. And, and they share a lot of health related complications or responses that either they're having neurologically, physically, and, and you cannot ignore, or I cannot ignore the pattern of what I'm learning about all of these families. And the fact that the medical community has not recognized or studied it enough dumbfounds me. So I'm with you 100% on that. Um, and when we got into this, this industry, it, every day that goes by, we are more shocked and more shocked and more shocked. And we think we have seen it all or heard it all. And oh my gosh, it's, it's heavy on the heart having to to do this every day. And that's another reason I, I commend all of you for what you do, because it's a very thankless in many situations position that y'all are taking, but also it causes nightmares. You can't get all of this out of your head. You understand these families are going through the hardest times in their life. And in some situations you can't even help them. You can just give them the information and pray that God helps them. But Shame on the medical community. That's what I say. Yeah, we need to lean on them really hard. In fact, I think we need to inform them that we intend to study doctors and find out what the heck is going on in their heads. <laughs> uh, I would say good luck with trying to find out what's going on in their heads. But um, I do think there needs to be, I don't look, I don't, I'm not a big fan of it. Let's get another government agency to, you know, act as this regulator, but do there, does there need to be a watchdog type um, privatized a company that does? Absolutely, there needs to be. But then again, we're starting to learn that, gosh, so many people or entities which are ran by people, meaning the, the lengths at which a person will go to make money it's almost hard to even trust that hey if we put together an agency to start looking into doctors and the medical i mean how can we then trust that agency i mean it's it's all comes back to relying on people that are so easily influenced by by money you know, that was my point. Uh, you probably know that I served as a prototype for chronic fatigue syndrome. And yes, sir. I thought, well, if any doctor hears about this, that mold was a factor in the very origin of the syndrome, they wouldn't dare to hide it because they're claiming that they want to solve the syndrome. 
So anybody can look at the outside, anybody can see that a doctor was exposed to this information and thereafter acts as if they never heard about it. So we could actually put this into the court of public opinion and let them be the judge as to whether doctors are acting with integrity. And a very good point, because wasn't that, how many years ago was that, Eric? 36. 36 years ago, this was definitely known about. It was documented with you. But yet it's still being pushed under that rug. And I even sometimes, this is where I really go after these corrupt mold inspectors that have 20 years in experience in this industry. And they try to, I guess, tout those credentials and, and hold themselves up so high when they go against me in court or just in depositions or just in writing. And I'm thinking to myself, shame on you. How, how are you proud of the fact that you still don't know how to assess a home after 20 something years. And I figured out how to do it in a few years. And meaning they don't want to progress. They want to stay with the status quo, just like those doctors that you had to deal with. Or in some situations, those doctors get pushed out. I don't know what the situation or what the facts are with the doctors that you dealt with are, but someone put a stop to it, meaning we should not be wondering what mold does today. But you know what? We damn sure know if a monkey can type on a typewriter or run on a treadmill or do something stupid, why don't we put money to good use instead of all this money that's being blown on irrelevant information, meaning good use would be, let's find out what's causing everyone in America to get sick, or let's call, find out what's causing everyone's immune systems to slowly deteriorate over time. And I'm not saying this because I'm in the industry, but there's a common denominator. And look, every generation that comes after us, they're starting with lower immune systems. And I'm only speaking about that based on my experience, understanding my clients. I have clients that are over 90. A lot of my clients are becoming middle-aged. And they have young children. And I'm learning about the different dynamics of all the children that are exhibiting different symptoms, but they're all part of the same family. They all live in the same house, but yet the, the symptoms vary greatly. And I, I definitely can't get too far into health. You know, I, I want to say a lot, but I have to be so careful. I'm kind of stopping myself now because I'm not a doctor and I'm gonna have a lot of eyes watching this. So I want to hear more from you though, because you can talk about it all day long. Well, with you. Looking into Stachybotrys, it's such a powerful immune suppressor that it basically shuts off your appropriate response to everything. So no matter what you got from the common cold to a fungal infection to Epstein-Barr virus, that's gonna pop out. So everybody's gonna have different symptoms, different infections, different um, presentations to the same common denominator, which is like chemically induced AIDS, the lowering of immune function. Very good point. When you talk about stachybotrys, though, are you saying it's stachybotrys causing it, or is it the mycotoxin produced by stachybotrys causing all of this? Well, there's definitely a mycotoxin component that is critical in disabling the immune system. But there's some evidence that the uh, beta-glucans, the shell wall of the spore itself, has properties, immunosuppressive properties that science doesn't quite understand. And we're interested in looking to that as well as the mycotoxins. So the research then that you are doing or the, your group is doing, it needs to be done, it has to be done. Um, I'm, I'm, by being in this industry for a long time, you end up with a network 
it might be a small network for me, but so the longer we're in it, the bigger the network gets. But with that comes more strength, which is going to hopefully result in a lot more research to where it can't be ignored anymore. And I, something tells me that's the way you're going. That's what you've been working on for 36 years. Um, and something also tells me that this won't stop, meaning between all of you, between us, between the other groups, or people that are taking a stance, this won't stop. They'll have to stop us before this will stop, is uh, the way I look at it. So watch your six. <laughs> well, this is growing so exponentially that now the number of sick doctors is starting to make a real dent in whether or not the mainstream medical profession accepts this. Very good point. I have quite a few clients that are doctors. I mean, quite a few. And um, they're shocked. They're shocked. And once they either hear, heal their children, which they're having to go the holistic route, um, they end up flip-flopping. They end up starting their own practice, meaning their eyes have been opened. And yes, you're right. If the people that are responsible for our health become affected by mold, then it, it's, it's a forced awakening. Yeah, and this is a really good time to study the behavior of doctors, because as we watch this transition, we see that all the new doctors entering this paradigm, they are getting the same kind of opposition as patients. Yes, I agree. But I also, I also think we also have to be careful of, look, a lot of the doctors that, um, I'm trying to be careful here, Put it this way, some naturopath doctors, they'll have six month to a year waiting list. And by the time the patient gets to them, the costs associated with just that initial consultation, it, I'm shocked at some of the costs I'm hearing about. It's not up to me to determine what a doctor charges, not at all. But I'm also, I guess sharing an opinion with some of my clients where I, I just recommend to them, be careful of the doctor that starts their own practice and professes to be this and this and that, and that charges all this money, but yet they're not getting results. Be careful of those doctors. Cause I don't want to say it's a trend. I would hate to say it's a trend. I'd hate to think it's a trend, but is it happening? Yes. Because they're making a lot more money by marketing themselves as that type of doctor now. Um, and look, any doctor that tries to heal their patients um, naturally, holistically, let's say, and understands mold, anyone that tries is great. Meaning everyone has to try at some point. But just well, be careful. I uh, decided that if we hit 30 years without any doctors looking into the incident that started chronic fatigue syndrome, I was going to amplify my criticism. So I don't mind calling them frauds and hypocrites and liars and people that are just in the business to rip off patients. Because if they had any integrity, they would respond to this within minutes and they would help to spread the word. I think we're on the same page with that. Can't, I don't want to keep saying too much, though. I probably said too much already. Um, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's the biggest problem. Why, why, here we are 36 years later after you, why are we still trying to figure out what the heck is this? That's such a, I don't want to say it's a joke because the amount of frustration that you should that you probably carry around with you. Well, you're doing something about it and that's what's good. Well, I'm really concerned about the 
systematic failure of the medical profession. They're not using science. They're not responding appropriately. And if they're not doing it for mold, what about for phthalates? What about for endocrine receptor disruptors? What about uh, glyphosate and all the other new threats that are coming up? You know, if they're not responding properly to something as blatantly obvious as mold, we can probably anticipate they're going to be equally bad for all the new things that are coming up. I agree. And, and, and you know, I get this a lot where they say science isn't there with mold. Yes, it is. It actually is. And you can just scour PubMed and there's over a hundred documents, studies where it talks about the correlation between mold or mycotoxins and this illness or this disease or this reaction, autoimmune reaction. It is there. The science is there. Um, if it wasn't, then my, a lot of my clients would not be winning. Put it that way. Well, that's why I brought up the question of being diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome because this is where we can really unveil the deceptive nature of doctors because chronic fatigue syndrome is an official CDC authorized instrument designed to solve a problem. And doctors know this, they've been to medical school. You know, a syndrome isn't just a fancy name for an illness. It's actually a research instrument with the criteria and they're supposed to abide by that. And you can observe that when you try to nail doctors down well, what about this chronic fatigue syndrome? What is it? They will try to say, well, that's just chronic fatigue. That's just a state of persistent tiredness. So they switch it from being an algorithm to solve a mystery into a colloquialism of just, that's just persistent tiredness. So if you see them doing that, they're either incompetent or they're doing it deliberately. If you explain to them that chronic fatigue syndrome is a, an official CDC instrument, and they keep reverting it as if they perceive it to be just another name for tiredness, that's when you can tell they're resorting to deceptive practices. Out of respect, I have to say this, I have to stay in my lane just because I can't, I, I, love ha I would love having this discussion with you, but Again, this video will be picked apart by people looking to destroy me. So I have to stay away from going down that road. I beg you with respect. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And I'm fortunate here because my livelihood doesn't depend on this. So they can go ahead and go after me. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, we're, we're beyond the hour here, Josh, and we, we really appreciate your time and just effort in, into this whole mess of things. And um, I just wanted to throw it out to Keely or Eric, do you guys have any last questions for Josh? That was easy, y'all, meaning I expected a lot more questions. Like, we can do this again or we can keep going. It's up to you, meaning I think there's a lot more that needs to be said, just so you know. Okay, we can keep going. I'm okay. Um, we do have another appointment at two o'clock, so we would have to stop before then. But um, I mean, what is it that you would love to tell our audience members? Focus on your home as, okay, so I walk into homes and I immediately understand des such desperation when, whether it's the husband or the wife, they'll take me to the, the bathing tub. And they'll get down there. Sometimes they jump in the tub and they just get on their hands and knees and they're showing me that under the clean out valve, there's a tiny bit of mold right there. Or behind the caulking, there's just a tiny bit of mold behind the caulking. And I instantly know how hard they have been searching for the mold that's making them sick. And it, it's heartbreaking. When someone is 
and this is in my experience, y'all. Everything that I, I share with you really is coming from my experience um, in this industry as a consultant. When I talk about a small amount of mold I'm being showed, less than the size of a dime, that is not going to be enough mold to cause an autoimmune reaction, in my experience. And as I started understanding when people are going through their own house looking for mold, they're really breaking it down on a micro level. But if we stick to the big picture, the macro, and you start trying to follow the air, follow the air, then you'll be able to inspect your own home. You'll be able to understand your own home. And going back to those three things necessary for molds to grow, food, oxygen, water. As long as you remember that. And here's something that anyone can do in their house, y'all. I always recommend doing it on a windy day. And all you have to do is look outside the window. If it is windy, then check your house this way. I'm gonna give you a few variations. I use smoke. I use a device called a smoke pencil. It shows me airflow. So on a windy day, let's say pick an interior wall. If you have a two story home, go to the second floor. Um, you can also do it on the first floor, but it has to be very windy. But on a windy day, go to an interior wall, meaning a wall that does not have a window or door leading to the outside environment. Go to an electrical receptacle or a light switch. Take off the plate cover, or sometimes you don't have to, but this makes it easier. Take off the plate cover. So what I do when I take off the plate covers is I hold smoke right in front of that electrical outlet. Sometimes the smoke goes into the wall. Sometimes it's pushed away from the wall. But, and it, it's very obvious, when the smoke is being pushed away from that outlet or that wall, that means air is coming out of that wall, right, Eric? I also go as far as, well, when I'm doing it, I'm actually performing an assessment. So I shut off the air conditioner. I make sure all doors and windows are closed, garage doors closed. I do all of those things. But a good quick self-test is you can actually take, just think of a plastic bag that you would get from a grocery store. You take that bag on a windy day and you tape it to the wall covering that outlet. If that bag starts to breathe in and out or just stay expanded, then that means air infiltration is affecting your home. And look, even if you're in a drier climate, the chances of you having a mold issue are extremely, extremely high. Think of being in Texas. Let's say this for Texas alone. If you have air infiltration occurring, then you have a problem with mold throughout every single wall in your house. Because a home, the wooden frame is interconnected. So if we have outside air entering the attic and driving down to the walls of the home, that air didn't just stop at the bottom of that second floor wall. It keeps going. It spreads out beneath the subflooring then it pressurizes the walls of the first floor. And inside that wall, remember, we have paper, we have wood. Then we also have oxygen. And that source of water is water vapor. So if you're going, driving yourself crazy because you've already hired three inspectors, four inspectors, and they can't find the problem because all they're doing is air quality samples, Find out if you have air flowing through the walls of your home. And if you do, especially if you're in Texas, then you have mold. And I will also say this, in a, where walls are just being affected by air infiltration and possession of water vapor, when I sample those walls, I do a wall cavity sample. 
I, I am not a fan of air quality samples, y'all, not at all. If I find there's a source of mold inside of a wall, I'm sticking a tube into the wall, I'm connecting that to my bio pump, and I'm gonna draw the air out of that wall. But now, at the same time, if we understand that mold grows on the surface, look, when people hire my company, they hire me to find the mold. So I'm not just gonna perform a wall cavity sample and see if mold shows up in that sample, no. As I'm pulling the air out of that wall, I hit the wall. That makes the mold jump off that surface. And then I'm gonna catch it. it. Increases my chances. And look, if I hit that wall and nothing shows up, it doesn't mean there's no mold. It doesn't. The air could have been going up away from my tube at the same time. But if I hit that wall and mold comes back, I'll say this because a lot of inspectors hate the fact that there might be a, a a consultant or an inspector or a technician that does wall cavity samples. A lot of people frown on that. So I always tell them, look, if there's no mold and I'm doing a wall cavity sample and I hit it, my hand's not putting the mold there. And me doing a wall cavity sample doesn't make the mold grow there, meaning there's mold there. My job is to find it. And y'all, you want, I got this question so much when I first got in this business. Okay, well, Josh, if there's mold in my wall, then can it come out of the wall? It goes back to follow the air. If there's air flowing through that wall, it's gonna come out of those electrical outlets or those light switches or push beneath the baseboard. And by the way, oh, that gets underneath the carpeting where there's plenty of dust. So air infiltration is not only the very problem construction defect by the way but it's in possession of water vapor which facilitates the self-originating mold growth but it's also the engine that flies the plane meaning that airflow is the very way mold gets out or mold is propelled from that wall so build a house where you don't have air flowing through it you're gonna you'll have a healthy home now, many other details but do that um but back to the air coming out from beneath the baseboard and staying beneath the carpeting. If we think of the carpeting, it's more of an adhesive type of backing, kind of like a waffle. And so if we consider the hottest months of the year, hot and humid, and that hot, humid air is driving down the walls of your home and pushing beneath this carpeting. Have you ever noticed how carpeting uh, needs to be stretched because it's rippled? Here's why that is happening, because hot and humid air causes that, that adhesive vacuum on the carpeting, thermal expansion to expand. But then flip it to winter months when it's cold and dry, air doesn't just magically stop. No, it's going to still continue to go beneath that carpeting. And now that carpeting contracts, which causes the reference. So if you have carpeting, that needs to be stretched, you also have a problem with mold. Um, so be careful about that. And what else was I wanting to say? Because that's a huge one, y'all. That's how you diagnose your own home. Um, oh, showers. Good God. Almost every tile shower I go into, y'all. You have to understand the moisture meter. You have to have the appropriate moisture meter and know how to use it, but we can get into that another day if you want. But I'm finding that almost every shower has, has an issue with mold, not with the grout, which a lot do, but that's not the biggest concern. I'm detecting elevated moisture content in almost every shower I go to. And here's why. Liquid water's not going through the tile. It's not. The problem is builders or contractors are using improper grout. Typically, they just use a cementitious grout that is absorbent. 
So every shower, small amounts of liquid water migrate into areas unintended for water retention, like a wall cavity. We're talking a probably $10 or $20 difference for builder or contractor to use proper grout. Here's the proper grout, an epoxy based grout, an epoxy impregnated grout. It exists. Build a shower with that. And it doesn't matter if you have back or board behind the tile. It doesn't matter if you have, you can have paper mache back there. It's never supposed to get wet, but they're using the wrong ground. Doesn't cost much more, but it goes back to if they can save a dollar, they don't care. Um, so that's how you build a proper shower. That's the problem with showers. And, and yes, you know, there's rubber membrane and that can be installed improperly, but it doesn't matter. If you use the proper grout, you don't even need a rubber membrane as a backup plan. But so there's my two cents on showers. Um, we'll go over one last thing and then we'll, we want to take a little break and have some lunch before our next meeting. <laughs> We're so busy today. <laughs> We'll go over one last thing, Josh, and let us know, um, you know, what is another major important thing to, to look for in a home? Foundation, but you have to be able to catch that during the building process. I, I cannot tell you how many times, especially in the community we're at in North Austin, they're building homes all around us. So it's almost a Sunday thing that we do, my wife and I, on the bikes. I go look at all these foundations where the forms are set and they have moisture barriers down, but not just in this community. I see it across Texas, or even in other states. You've got to start with the foundation. That's why it's called that. They're not putting proper moisture barriers beneath the concrete foundation. So that's setting the home up for failure from day one. So all of these things, every, anyone can teach themselves what I'm talking about especially when you know that's an issue, you can Google it, you can look it up. Become your own expert on construction defects. If you focus on airflow, proper grout, moisture barriers, flashing, air barriers, continuous air barriers, focus on those things. Then when it comes time to build your house, you're gonna build a healthy home. And it's very possible. You can do it in the middle of a rainforest. Just have to do the research yourself. Um, or get in touch with us and I can say what else to get out in front of, but there you have it. We can do this again. There's so much yeah. more. Yeah, we'd love to do this again. Thank you again, Josh. And if our, um, our audience members wanted to work with you, how could they do that? Uh, contact our office at 832-992-6653 or go to our website. Um, texasmoldinspectors.com. Fantastic. Thank you again for joining us, Josh. Uh, feel free to sign off if you'd like. I was just going to record our outro. Okay. Definitely an honor and a pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation with Josh Rochelle from Texas Mold Inspectors. Uh, boy, is he knowledgeable and very thorough. I think he's probably the most thorough mold tester we, we've interviewed on this show on what he does and, and what he's able to look for and, and help you with. Um, so we, we thank him for that. Please check out our Patreon page. We have a wonderful group education page that we share a lot of great content um, and also just support us uh send us a little shout out uh buy us a coffee but i think it's called buymeacoffee.com slash exposingmold.com check us out and uh support the show so we can keep it going thanks again everyone we'll see you next time